Okay, this video is for the beginning of sensation and perception, which is module 16 through 21 in our current book. So, uh, first thing is we have to dif uh, differentiate between what is sensation and what is perception. So, sensation is all that information that you get from all of your individual senses. So, your sense of sight and touch and smell and taste and hearing and all of that stuff. All that information that you're getting and you're in taking in to your brain um, from all your different senses. And then perception is going to be basically putting all that in some sort of organization and interpreting that information and um, coming to some sort of conclusion, basically. Um, and that's going to be perception. So uh, there are a couple different ways we can process information uh, and we can come to a conclusion about information. And so the first way is what we call bottom-up processing. And bottom-up processing is basically taking in all that sensory information and then coming to some sort of interpretation or conclusion because of that information. Um, so you're taking in information from all your different senses and then you're going to use that to basically come to some sort of organized conclusion. So the best example I have for you is actually um, from a few years ago. Um, I uh, probably have told you already that um, my daughter is a swimmer um, and she uh, has been swimming for about three years now. Um, and like within her first year particularly, uh, you know, we obviously were, um, she was new to swimming and um, we'd gone to a lot of meets and um, she uh, had mostly swam at a bunch of different high school pools. Well, the opportunity presented itself for her to go to her first swim meet at IUPUI's natatorium. So I knew that the natatorium was large. Um, I had never been there myself personally. Um, and when I was getting ready to take her to the meet, uh, I was trying to become, be prepared with uh, what uh, I needed to bring myself uh, to, you know, the meet to be able to be comfortable and productive or whatever during the course of the meet. Because if you've never been to a swim meet, swim meets are long, uh, you know, four to five hours, right? So here's what I did was is that uh, I... I legit did this, seriously. Um, I went online and I looked for uh, information about the IUP, IUPUI Natatorium downtown. Uh, and I came up with this picture right here, right there, okay? Uh, and so I was looking at this picture uh, and I am taking the information in, bottom-up processing. Uh, obviously, I'm not there, so, you know, if if you're literally there, then you could take in information from all of your senses, but I'm just looking at a picture online. So I'm taking the information in from, you know, obviously my site and trying to figure out, here's my question is, is that should I bring my stadium chair to the swim meet? So uh, if you know anything about uh, high school pools and facilities, um, a lot of times they are bleachers, right? No backs, okay, that you're sitting in for a spectator. Um, and so... Uh, about the time my daughter had started swimming, my husband and I invested in some really good quality stadium chairs. You know, the kind that floats flat, and then when you open it up, you have like a back that supports your uh, a back rest, and then you also have a place to sit on. Um, so, you know, you don't, you don't get a backache after sitting on bleachers for 20 minutes. So I'm looking at this picture, and I'm trying to figure out, okay, should I bring my stadium chair? So what do you think? Should I bring my stadium chair? Well, bottom-up processing, you know, I was taking in all this information. Well, obviously, I'm missing a whole bunch of my other senses, and so I, I can't really tell, okay? Um, usually, when you go to a pool, um, you're taking in all this information as far as the smell, the chlorine, the loudness. The acoustics are terrible. Uh, the... Um, how, how crowded it is and everything else. And so, usually, I can actually tell. Uh, but in this case, I can't. So uh, I'm still kind of flummoxed. And so I actually rely on top-down processing to make my decision. So top-down processing is where um, you are guided by these higher level mental processes. You are actually constructing your perceptions based on your experience and expectations. So in other words, it's like preconceived notions, right? So based off from uh, what you have seen and heard and done in the past, okay, 
What's my preconceived notion? So as a result, that's going to color how I see things and how I influence, how I um, basically make decisions. So with top-down processing, as I said, my daughter had been to a lot of swim meets, and most of them were at high school pools. Okay, So I see okay, and interpret what I want to see and interpret. So because of that, can you guess, did I bring my stadium chair or not? Yes, I did, because most high school pools had bleachers, and I needed it. So I brought it with me, got there, guess what? All of these lovely little blue sections right here, these are actual chairs with backs on them. The stuff behind it are all the bleachers. Now, obviously, I had somebody that pointed out, well, it depends upon how many people, how, many, how big the meat is as to whether or not you need your stadium chair. And I'm like, good point, because if obviously all those blue chairs are filled up, then yes, I would have to sit in the bleachers. Luckily, they were not. Uh, another example of bottom-up versus top-down processing, um, if you've ever had, like, for example, a new class, so whether it be, um, you know, the first day of school or the first day of the new semester, and you go in and maybe it's, uh, particularly when it's like a new teacher to the school and so nobody knows anything about them, right, and you go into the room and you're looking around and you're taking in all this information as far as, you know, okay, what does the room look like? What does it smell like? What does it sound like? You know, what does this teacher sound like when they're, you know, doing their little spiel the first day? Are they, you know, um, going and, and uh, you know, talking about stuff that, you know, you're just like, oh, my God, this is going to be really boring, right? That's bottom-up processing. Whereas top-down processing oftentimes, more often happens when, you know, you have like a teacher that you uh, have either had before or at least have been in the school for a while. And so the top-down processing where, you know, people will tell you, oh my gosh, this teacher is so, so boring. And you go in with that attitude and that expectation, right? Um, and so that's bottom-up versus top-down. Okay, that said... Um, Kind of going into something that was um, in your book um, in our uh, biology unit, um, and honestly, it's been in kind of a lot of different units, and so I don't know, maybe I'll have to move it. But talking about does the mind exist separate from the body? So um, there's a couple of different perspectives with this, and so dualists believe that the mind exists separate from the body. I um, mean, the, they can kind of they kind of look at the mind as almost like a soul, right? Um, can you um, exist separate from your body, meaning um, what makes you who you are? Is that just part of this body? Um, you know, there's a lot of science fiction movies and TV shows out there where they're talking about, you know, well, could you go and theoretically remove the mind or the soul from that body and preserve it somehow and then, like, transplant it in another body? Well, dualists would basically say yes, because they believe that um, your body and your mind are made from different substances, and you could separate potentially, obviously if there's like scientific way to do this, potentially separate the two. Okay, whereas monists basically said that no, they're the same thing, and you know you t you can't separate them. And what makes you who you are is part of it. Part of it has to do with your actual body, right? Um, so they. Monist basically said it's just, you know, your mind is just a different level of the same thing. And it's your mind is just a different level of your body. And you couldn't separate them. Now, <coughs> an alternative view to this problem is what we call reductionism. And this is the idea that everything will become, eventually become biological. Um, and so reductionism is this idea that as we become, learn more and more about the body, and for example, our last unit, we are talking about the biology side uh, piece, uh, as we learn more and more about the brain and the body and mapping things, for example, um, everything will eventually be reduced down to biological things. And so uh, it will be more, uh, psychology will just be a part of biology rather than a separate field. Uh, so kind of, you know, where do you fit with that? Um, so, you know, are you a dualist where you believe, like, this guy, he's got, you know, he's meditating and he has his mind separating from his body? Uh, or this one where it says, aha, so the body does, really does rule the mind. So we have a monist viewpoint where I know my thing can't, needs to go away. There's a head down here, right? Um, or this idea, I think, therefore I am. I'm here because I'm here. I know this is kind of deep, weird stuff, right? So, 
that kind of leads us to this idea of dual processing. And dual processing is the idea that information is processed at both a conscious and subconscious level. So <coughs> uh, this is going into the um, standpoint of there's some things that your brain and your mind is picking up that are conscious. So for example, right now, hopefully you are listening to me um, and you are consciously aware of the fact that you are listening to me. Um, but at the same point in time, there's also things that are going on around you uh, that maybe you weren't really paying attention to, but your brain is picking up on it. It's just that it's not finding it important enough to really give it your undivided attention. For example, right now I am in my classroom um, and I can still hear the air conditioning go off. Uh, so I, now I can listen to that, so if you possibly pay attention to that. Uh, I can also tell you that I have my door open and it's before school and so I hear a lot of chatter outside in the hall. Again, stuff that I'm not really paying attention to, but I could. Okay, My brain is taking all of that information in. I'm just choosing to ignore it. Okay, So there's been a lot of studies that look at this. Uh, one particular study that I wanted to talk about one such study uh, that looked at uh, the idea of this dual processing was by, done by the, um, a couple of psychologists called Barr and Chartrand. I'm probably saying their name wrong. Um, but uh, they basically um, went and had uh, two sets of people, uh, two groups of people, and they were told, the, the participants were told that they were you, um, in a language experiment. Um, and so they were, uh, in one group, exposed to very rude words, okay? Rude words, I, I have a bunch of rude words in there. Uh, and the other group was exposed to some very nice words, right? Uh, and so they were, again, told this was a language experiment. And then they were asked to go and interrupt somebody else, okay? So, for example, if you were in this experiment and I would go and say, hey, can you go downstairs and ask Mr. Riley this question. And then Mr. Riley would be, um, you know, talking to somebody else, right? Um, so the interesting thing was is that who uh, actually went and interrupted and, you know, just interrupted the conversation and did not, you know, say excuse me or wait for the conversation to end. Interestingly enough, those that were ex uh, exposed and primed uh, with the rude words, 67% uh, of them uh, actually went and interrupted the conversation, whereas only 38% of those in the polite uh, group actually interrupted. So again, showing how we're kind of unconsciously picking up some of those things. All right, uh, that's it for now. Let me know if you have any questions.